There you go. Oh, that means the Zoom started. Uh, <laughs> all right, hold on. Let me hit the record. Oh, welcome to the Zanzizi podcast with yours truly, Red Dead 2023, joined in the interwebs with Cromulent Jesse and on our YouTube channel. Check it out. Oh, yeah, hoy, hoy. Hey, man. How are you, dude? Hi. How how are you? Um, I'm great. I'm fucking feeling. It's it's been a minute since I podcasted. I've been on vacation all this week, uh, working on vocals for the new glass field. I'm not singing. I'm just helping uh, the singer figure out what he's gonna do. But also, like, I don't know. I mean, we're all dudes who were in bands, especially in the podcast circles I frequent. It's like every single one of us is was part of a uh, uh, a, a band or new many bands or help lug gear into a, a Moss I, Isley cantina. I spent like uh, the ages from 15 to about 24 doing nothing but that. So I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. That's where, that's totally. where Hella Greg and I became best buds and, and we oh. joined a band together. What? Okay. So I don't know this. This is fascinating to me. What what did you and what did uh, Greg do in the band? Uh, we so we both wrote the songs. We were like okay. collaborative songwriters, uh, and he was drummed. Like a... He drummed and I sang. Oh, I was gonna. <laughs> That's awesome. I you you have the vibe of the singer. That's cool. Thanks, but man. you but not 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 a good singer. A, a singer that would lug his own microphone. Yes, hundred um, percent. SM58 for days. There you go. Uh <laughs> dude, that's crazy. So, okay, so he he yeah, he's definitely got the conspiracy theorist drummer vibe. I get it. No. He, 100% and we were sense. just we just thought we were going to be the biggest thing in pop punk since Newfound Glory, bro. Oh. Well, you're big in my heart and a lot of people's hearts cuz your show's coming back in October, right? Yes. October. Very excited oh, yeah. about the October, the October comeback, don't you know? <laughs> well, we've been talking about it for a while, but today's episode, Jim Carrey. Got the oh, soundtrack. The- righty then. There it is. Our generation, Steve Martin, I would say. I think that's the, such uh, a that's such an accurate statement. I, you know, it's funny because. <laughs> That when I first got into him would have been when he was on In Living Color. And for me, I remember distinctly my dad was kind of on the fence with In Living Color. Like he liked some of the skits, but he he, he was that he he's that conservative who can who can vibe to like the Bill Mars of the of the world, but everything else he's like, no, they go too far. <laughs> and like in Living Color was that same thing where it's like, I can watch this. I have a friend who's black. This is okay. <laughs> you know? And then, then 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 all of a sudden Jim Carrey shows up and he's like, oh, okay. And then he's like, oh, well, he's no Steve Martin. Uh, and that was his thing he would always say. And I was like, well, he's, he's my generation, Steve Martin, because he's fucking, he was huge, like similar to. Oh, so huge. Yeah, I, I mean, like, full disclosure, my first date was to Ace Ventura 2 in middle school. <laughs> That's so awesome. And uh, he was, like, for me, it was him and Robin Williams were, like, my favorite, like, <laughs> funny guys. I think uh, those are two dudes that it's, it's very easy to, like, look up to comedically. Totally. To aspire yeah. to be like. And I think a lot of our sense of humor came from that, like kind of like the no holds bar, just like do anything to make your friends laugh. Yeah, it's like and, just shy of slapstick. Yes, totally. And and you know he he was such a uh, impressionist too. Like in his early stand up, it's all like him doing, you know, like Jimmy Stewart and different yeah. like old timey kind of impressions that like. For for guys like me, that just, I mean that it's it, it's similar to like when Bill Hader would do his impersonations of 
say like uh what's the guy from mashes i can't think of the the, the actor off the top of my head um just those 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 kind of almost like weirdly ob- obscure but like so perfect that when you hear them you just laugh and your tits off yes um, and and he even what was great about him is his physicality where you know there's this famous clip where he's like all right and now clint eastwood and he just transforms his face like he, it's almost like no matter what he was going to do with his voice he just was able to contort his face to look just like clint eastwood and it's yeah. just such a such a unique ability. It was I'm sorry, it was Alan Alda. Oh, okay, it was, okay. It's, it's, it's the Bill Hader one that always makes me like <laughs> Bill Hader is like a great just, one too. <laughs> totally, totally. Um so what about you? Like what how did you were you just like me? Was it cuz I think you're you're what? 36. 36. Okay, yeah. so you're about my you're my sister's age-ish. Um me and my i'm the oldest so i'm 41 my sister's 36 my brother's 33 34 uh we were all like in love with the dude like yeah 100 uh, like we're, we're like the ninja turtles power rangers jim carrey you know quit describing my childhood bro <laughs> <laughs> Go, throw ghostbusters and back to the future in there and we're fucking done i don't need anything else exactly so exactly. i I did not grow up on Living Color. I remember, so I had a roommate um, in the college years who had DVDs, and that's how I got to see In Living Color. So I didn't see In Living Color until I was an adult. Um, But, so 1994, which was like, I mean, I'm sure you know this, you put together the show, that was Jim Carrey's year. And I would have been oh, he came. I would have been seven that year. So in that year, we got the mask, Ooh. Ace Ventura, and Dumb and Dumber. And my parents did not censor us. Like we got to basically watch whatever we wanted that wasn't porno. And so exactly. And so that year, I mean, I I got my Ace Ventura VHS taken away for <laughs> for <laughs> rewinding and replaying the part where he's talking to Tone Loke. And he's and, he, and he's talking with his ass, and he goes, "Asshole, <laughs> oh, yep. sodomia. Hunt, yeah, I, dude, dude, it's that's to, it's to this day one of just like the excuse me, do you have a mint? Perhaps <laughs> yeah, some <dude>. banaka. <laughs> it's like <laughs> one of my most like it's just infused into my brain. Oh God! Those three it, movies would for sure be my introduction, and I don't think I've—I mean, maybe recently I know he's done some stuff that I don't think I've really absorbed. But between '94 yeah. and, I mean, probably 10 I would years say '94 to 2004 is like perfect era for I me. I probably too. saw and, all of it, if not most of it, in between then, and yeah. a lot too, even the bad stuff. And 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 it's hard for me. This is this is one of those interesting things too, where I I have I have such a high esteem for this guy, especially because I felt like I grew with his career too. Like I was able to like look back on it, and like at this point, I've gone through all of like my heydays, like comedians with my girls who are like, you know, below like between fifteen and nine, mm-hmm. and like. Their favorite, oddly enough, is probably Adam Sandler. Which also, I mean, a, not too much after Jim Carrey, I would have definitely been walking around going, Yeah, you be, yeah, you be, yeah, you. Totally. <laughs> yeah. I must no, have been and a I very annoying child. And when you said you were wearing out your 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 tape of Ace Ventura, I was also wearing out my tape of Billy Madison. Yes. So. The, that era of comedy for me is like hugely insp- inspiring as far as like my taste and like I still insane. watch Happy Gilmore probably quarterly like a year doesn't yeah. go by where I don't watch it a handful of times again um, and, my... and we we do this on the show all the time it's a future episode Adam Sandler but keep going yes. yeah well my I was just gonna say to, I golf a little bit and my putter head cover in the Price is Right font says, the price is wrong, bitch. 
<laughs> yeah. Dude, the the actor, the, the his nemesis from that movie, like makes bank off cameo just being that oh, character. Why not? And he just he just probably eats it up too, enjoys the shit out of it. Oh, oh yeah, totally, totally. So, getting into the to the background here a bit. In case anybody didn't know this, he is a Canadian and American actor. Born January 17th, 1962, as James Eugene Carey. G-E-T. Eugene! That's right. That doesn't seem like a very Canadian name, I'm just going to say it. James? Eugene. Eugene Carey? I mm. think it's just Eugene. For some reason, now that I've been in the South, and I had a grandfather <laughs> named Eugene, uh, who was from Virginia... <laughs> Just, it's an old pappy name you know yeah, they were although i don't know that i know specifically any canadian names off the top. terrence and philip maybe <laughs> those are pretty canadian <laughs> justin i guess is canadian <laughs> i don't know uh carrie was born in the toronto suburb of new market ontario canada to kathleen a homemaker and percy carrie a musician and accountant he was raised a Roman Catholic and has three older siblings, John, Patricia, and Rita. His mother was of French, Irish, and Scottish descent, and his father was of French Canadian ancestry. The family's original surname was Carre, C A R R E. So was that like a switch over when they came came to America? I think. I think so. I think it was a little, uh, okay, uh, you can leave your fucking fancy little umlaut looking markings out of here. We, we, we like our names shortened and able to pronounce, please. <laughs> Welcome to Staten Island, bitch. Um, so at age eight, he began making faces before a mirror and discovered a talent for doing impressions. At age 10, Carrie wrote a letter to Carol Burnett of the Carol Burnett. Burnett show, That's awesome lady. Cool. She's a, she just like turned ninety. Good for her. Good for Carol yeah. Burnett. And she and, and Dick Van Dyke just got to get together and do something, huh? I know. Yeah. Like, I mean, they're still uh, cart their skeletons out, make them do a jig <laughs> or something. I mean, look. All due respect to these people. I'm like, I'm all about it. Like, sixties being the new forties or the twenties or whatever it is whatever the thing is, is we're living longer and these people can make us laugh. If Mel Brooks can still be out there and be alive, I'm all about them making money. I mean, did you know he secretly produced the movie? I think it was Poltergeist. I don't think I knew that. And I pride myself on being a wealth of, uh, not even horror, just of any, one of my favorite genres of anything to watch is like documentaries about, the process of making a certain movie whatever that may be i just eat that shit up i wish there was more behind the scenes with jim carrey i watched the man in the moon which i'm sure we'll we could touch on later but uh, oh yeah Yeah, what a fantastic documentary that was it it's fascinating you know especially because like obviously he is a character actor type you know, especially being like such an impersonationist, I think that plays into some of the mania that he might have suffered, if I had to guess. And again, I I don't want to say, obviously, if you have mental health issues, therapy is a welcome thing. Seek it out and talk to somebody. Medication is, is out and available. I mean, we're in our infancy with with what I believe to be the current mental health level that we're at. I think it's a new thing, but um, people suffer different forms, I think, of PTSD. And his family was, I mean, his early life, it wasn't necessarily like doom and gloom, but he, he came from a very poor upbringing. Right. From what, point right. Where, wasn't his dad like strictly a musician? And when he realized he wasn't going to make enough money, like that's when he became an accountant. And right, right. But it was like kind of a miserable ex- ex- experience, though, because like at at a certain point they were living out of an automobile, and you know, with 
older siblings and being all tight like that. I mean, it's just, that's just not cool, man. Yeah, that's, I, that's tough. I don't, I don't wish people to be poor, you know, and in a world like this where it feels like we have an excess, it, it feels better to see everyone taken care of, you know, and I think Canada uh, specifically at the time, what I'm not, I'm not necessarily sure what the economic structure was in, in Canada at the time. I've been, I, have you been to Canada? Uh, I've crossed into Vancouver many, many years ago. I've never really got to experience Canada. I would You're say like, I've been to Tim Hortons. Bro. Yeah, okay? That was like basically it. That was basically it. I like Mike Myers. Hockey's all right. <laughs> uh, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get into more of it. Anyway, so like I said, he was a huge fan of Carol Burnett Center. Um, at age 10, Carrie wrote her a letter pointing out that he was already a master of impressions and should be considered for a role on the show. He was overjoyed when he received a form letter reply. Uh, he was also a fan of Monty Python. Fucking love Monty Python. Hey, TV show, Monty big Python. big shout out to Carol Burnett or that staff member of Carol Burnett's who wrote <laughs> Jim Carrey back, right? Because what if they didn't? I know, right? The world is a vampire, man. <laughs> we'll start a band. Uh, no, I. You know what? Yeah, big, big up to anybody who works in any sort of entertainment and takes the time to respond to fan mail. 100%. I can't imagine the, the Taylor Swift uh, entourage of replies to letters and emails and tweets or whatever. Like those. The, you you get all types, but like, you know, I I try to pride myself as the type of fan who who buys the merch and pre-orders, you know, like indie games or tries 100%. to fund the Kickstarter Kickstarters and all that sort of thing, or Patreons and things like that. And like, it it's important to support to support and to acknowledge your fan base, and I think that's awesome. Like even, especially in an early time in the seventies, I can't imagine, um, there was much for, for, for replying, especially when somebody was as big as say Monty Python. Do you know that Monty Python and Genesis played so like football together when they, they joined on tour at, at certain points in the seventies? I had no Can you imagine idea. Phil Collins and John Cleese running around playing fucking English football. <laughs> oh, you mean soccer? Yeah. <laughs> Fucking UK. Uh, I always like to go back to the argument that they originally called it soccer and then changed it later to be pretentious, in my opinion. So <laughs> they, they do everything. Come out the serial chillers, guys. Not Zanzizi. That was the opinion, <laughs> yeah, that was the, an opinion of Cromulent Jesse. I'm going to drop a deuce. Well, you mean the Lou? Oh, who's who's Lou? Shut the fuck up. Anyways, no, we love you guys. You guys are great. Uh, so Monty Python. Uh, he was a fan of Monty Python. His TV show Monty Python's Flying Circus aired in the '70s. In 2014, Carrie appeared on Monty Python's Best Bits mostly and recalled the the effect on him of Ernest Scribbler, played by Michael Palin, laughing himself to death in the funniest joke in the world sketch. Radio Times states, you'll see why immediately Palin's performance is uncannily Harry S. So it was like an early influence on him was Michael Palin, who, I mean, those guys are all fucking legends in my book. They're, yeah, they're I, I would say I, I probably haven't absorbed enough Monty Python. Like I've seen Flying Circus, and you know all of the holy grail holy grail yeah probably like the mainstays i've definitely you know like when i see a bumper sticker that says your mother was a hamster and your father smelled of elderberries you know like it mm -hmm. i get a chuckle i think coconuts and you know like i i yeah. see it but when you, like the deep dives i feel like there's so much there that i need to go back and it's, and, it's really and, not that much i mean like you I would say Life of Brian, watch Life of Brian, watch Holy Grail, and watch the, the TV show, like the, the old TV show. Uh, the, the skits are awesome. and um, But I mean, like, 
really holy grail is the holy grail of the monty python stuff i mean i if 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 anybody wants to know where i get my french impression of john cleese you know taunting king arthur on top of the castle like i believe the last time we were together there were a lot of french accents happening there was and that (laughs) that's an excellent uh reference to our napoleon bonaparte episode doing quite well in our in our download so if you haven't checked it out check it out and check out serial killers you goof well i have to so, be honest i am not surprised that this uh, episode this is performing well <laughs> i i would get to that but i am smoking two minutes cigarettes when i close my uh, eyes it's like i'm here with john cleese <laughs> exactly uh in a um so okay, so Carrie spent his early years in in a in the borough of Scarborough, Ontario, part of Metropolitan Toronto, where he attended Blessed Trinity Catholic Elementary School in the North York. His family later moved to Burlington, Ontario, where they would spend eight years. Jim attended Aldershot High School while there. Uh, sometime later, his family became homeless and lived together in a Volkswagen Volkswagen van while teenage Jim and his brother spent months living in a tent in Charles Daly Park on the Lake Ontario shore in Lincoln, Ontario. I mean, not to make light of it, but if you're going to stay in a vehicle, that's (laughs) that's probably the one, right? (laughs) I mean, the German engineering, it goes a long way, guys. Just saying. Vehicles. I always wanted a Jetta. That was my high school dream car was to get a Jetta. They were pretty popular pretty popular i do remember that i do remember a lot of jettas in the parking lot <laughs> you know uh, the living in a tent thing i had a i wouldn't say a buddy he was a guy i knew who chose that life uh the living in a tent and he was like a you know ah, i just go to this park for a while they kick me out i go to this one you know i sometimes i'll do it in people's backyard but I, it's hard for me to imagine uh being high school age and my parents being like hey it's the only option or now that you know we are fathers ourselves getting getting to that and being like all right kids listen (laughs) only two of you can stay in the car tonight two of you got to go camp at the park well if i i'm basically less than a gum under someone's shoe if i don't know the wi-fi password or have cheese it's on hand for my kids so like (laughs) like let alone homeless like at this point i mean to make ends meet you know obviously i do i do fine even though you know single dad living out here but i've got an amazing partner and my my beautiful girlfriend and it's life is good but but yeah it's like to live in a vehicle like it's just it's it's such an interesting contrast knowing his life timeline to see to say go from basic like destitute homelessness to like a million multi-millionaire you know it's almost like it takes that you know like you got to get that low to get that high exactly well and that's all life's lessons are really taught that way anytime i've ever pushed myself hard in life it's because of basically hitting some sort of like a ooh, this could go real bad if I don't change my tune <laughs> or like start fucking eating some more honey nut Cheerios instead of having uh McGriddles every day in the Navy or like actually getting on a treadmill or you know, like it there's some truth to taking care of yourself, folks, mentally and physically. But this guy had a hell of a ride in uh his early impressionist work in Toronto, Carrie's first stand-up comedy experience took place in 1977 at the age of 15. That's a, with that's his a, father. That's a pretty uh, tough time to get on stage for the first time. Like I was probably never more insecure than between the ages of like 14 and hey, 17. Hey, you know? hey it's me, Jesse. <laughs> just so many pimples. Just, see, just such just a pizza see. face. <laughs> just a, just yeah just pizza face you know jesse outside and right next to a trash can is greg just popping his head out i think the problem was less cracking more that i got like my full adult voice at 14 but my body didn't match it 
So I like walked up looking like a child. I was like, hey, everybody, how's the evening going? They're like, what the fuck did you just say? Hey, is that our substitute teacher? <laughs> Already had gray in the have, beard. <laughs> yeah. I don't even have pubes yet. Uh, it's okay. I didn't either. It was a weird, yeah. But 15 is a fucking weird time, man. Yeah. It takes a um, lot to get up there and just put it all on the line. Yeah, totally. And big up to him for like having that. At 15, with his father trying to help him put together a stage act, driving him to downtown Toronto to debut at the recently opened Yuck Yuck Comedy Club, operating one night a week out of a community center. The 519th basement on Church Street. For the performance, Carrie had his attire a polyester leisure suit chosen by his mother, who reasoned that's how they dress on the Dean Martin celebrity list. <laughs> Dude, like, despite the downfalls and the tough times, it does seem like he's got a pretty solid set of parents. Based oh, on, totally. like, not only what you said, but, like, what I know. It's like, yeah. yeah, they were, you know, obviously his dad was an artist and he supported that art. So it's just even cool to hear, like, oh, his dad drove him to... The, my dad was like, hey, yeah. here's your baseball bag. It's two miles away. You're going to want to start now. You know? <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> yeah, fuck Kentucky, by the way. Just kidding. Uh, anyway, no, so, but no, totally, yeah. Hey, you know what? Big up to the parents who, who support you in your, in your goals. Yeah. And this was, this was a thing for him. Uh, pubescent Carrie's conventional impersonations bombed proving ill-suited for a club with a raunchy comedic sensibility and giving him doubts about his potential as a professional entertainer. Decades later, recalling Carrie's stand-up debut, Yuck Yuck owner Mark Breslin described it as bad, rich, little. His family's financial struggles made it difficult for them to support Carrie's show business ambition. But eventually, the family's financial situation improved, and they moved into a new home in Jackson Point. With more domestic stability, Carey returned to the stage in 1979 with a more polished act that led to his first paid gig, a 20-minute spot at the Hayloft Club on Highway 48 in Scarborough, reported uh, $20 compensation on a bill with the mother of pro performer from the Pig and Whistle. He soon faced his fears and went back downtown to the site of his debacle from two years earlier, Yuck Yuck, that had in the meantime, moved into a permanent location on Bay Street in the fashionable Yorkville district. In a short period of time, the 17-year-old went from open mic nights at the club to regular paid shows, building his reputation in the process. Now, parallel to his increasing local Toronto area popularity as an impressionist stand-up comic, Carey tried to break into sketch comedy auditioning to be a cast member for the 1980-81 to 81 season of NBC's Saturday Night Live. Boy. Yeah, I, I heard that he, they he gave it a couple shots to trying to get onto SNL. Yeah. Uh, I didn't know it was that early, though. Yeah, 80-81. When we're talking pre-Sandler, that's... Post, that's like uh, within the first, like, 10 seasons of the show, right? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I think it's like 75, 76 when okay. they started. So very early. I know Chevy Chase was like season one and then he was out. And then <laughs> Steve Martin comes in soon after because I know they had the Who on there. And then I think Keith Moon dies early 80s. So Steve Martin's in there somewhere. Which is interesting. Like, my dad would have been watching for Steve Martin and he'd be like, Who's this fucking new guy? This <laughs> Dean Martin suit on. Uh, but so uh, basically, Harry ended up not being selected by the show's new executive producer, Gene Domanian, who picked 31 year old Charles Rocket instead. Yeah, who? I had never heard of <laughs> Who? Yeah. Exactly. Decades Looks later. Stupid after right now, Gene. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Decades later, after establishing himself as a Hollywood film star, Carrie would host the show in May 1996, January 2011, and October 2014. After not getting Saturday Night Live, Carrie took a voice acting job performing clutch cargo inspired bits on the All Night Show, an overnight programming uh, program airing locally on the CFMT. 
TV channel branded as multilingual television or MTV. That's like, <laughs> oh, it's MTV. That's pretty sweet. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, that's, that's like... it. Yeah, that's. That's a little too wild for us up here in Canada. <laughs> so what we got here, some kids cartoons. We just run them all night, huh? Uh, <laughs> we got this guy in his leisure suit. He comes in here. He's got a real stretchy face. This kid. He's great. What what wonderful pieces of lost media those probably are, right? Like, wh- like oh, can, totally. we, can we see the cartoons that well, Jim Carrey the- did voiceovers for in the early 80s in Canada? Like the first couple movies he was in, and and you can tell it's it's not his starring vehicle. He's just getting like acting work at the time. Like they tried to bump those fuckers up big time. Like when it he hit superstardom. Like I remember initially when I would go to like Blockbuster Video or like I Am Video, which is in my area, I would look for like what anything Jim Carrey when it would come out and. There were a few like like T boob comedies he was in. There's like a made for TV movie that he was in. I think he played like a, a a gay teen or something like that. My mom actually recognized him when I started ranting about him because like one of his first performances was uh, on this like I said made for TV movie, which I'll bring up here later. But like he there was there was some real like early like acting chops that he showed too and i think anybody who's got like i i always say it's like i i get excited when like my comedic comedic idols do do dramatic roles especially like sandler like robin williams jim carrey has undoubtedly my favorite dramatic role that any of my comedy heroes have done I, I feel uh, like uh, I like to throw Bill Murray into that. A little older, probably oh, the yeah. generation before, but God damn it, his dramatic roles are I, just amazing. Yeah. Or uh, it, you know, and it it's it's like um, him and uh, of of his era, like when you see Steve Martin do dr- drama. He hasn't like he's really great in comedy. Like The Jerk is one of my favorite comedies of all time. But like, I don't know if he's necessarily been given something with some some real chops but write to us or recommend to the instagram or i know he's got a, a newer show that people I've, I've heard really good things about uh, it's I, awesome because him and martin short are fucking dynamite together see i just have martin a hard Short's time off. with tv shows basically i'll start watching them when they're canceled that's usually like that's how I like to absorb TV now. I just watch movies until I find a show where like, yeah, it went for four seasons and got canceled. I'm like, yes, yeah, I get <laughs> now that. I have a TV no. show to watch. Exactly. Uh, yeah, it it there's some shows that I'm in. Like I've been watching The Bear season one and now season two is done. That show I like because it's not like those thick hour hour and change like 30 minute in and out yeah. like i can i can i can fit those in especially at bedtime with the lady but uh yeah I, i'm just too busy watching crime and jesse on twitch which you should watch oh yeah that's twitch.tv slash crime and jesse oh baby <laughs> you know what i right. I, I sorry i i just thought of this too no, go ahead. a movie my mom liked a lot was uh earth girls are easy Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And that was pretty early for him, too. I was just looking it up. I was like, when was that? That was 1988. Yeah, yeah. And you've got a youngish uh, Jeff Goldblum in there, too. Exactly. What handsome dudes they were. Oh, God, yeah. Especially Jeff Goldblum, that era. That's like the hunkiest he gets. Yeah, and little little Gina Davis. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, Oh my God! I forgot that she it was, was Damon the... Wayans too. It's Damon Wayans, Jeff yeah. Goldblum, and Jim Carrey. What a! I need to just watch this again. I feel like this yeah. is a uh, rewatchable. Yeah, yes, my dude. Yes. It'll hold up purely out of nostalgia. Oh, totally, totally. Um, continuing to perform his stand-up act of contortionist impressions in the city of Toronto and surrounding towns in February 1981, 19 year old Carrey was booked as the opening act for the rock band Godo at the Roxy Theater in Bari for two shows on consecutive nights. The rock crowd booed him off stage and he refused to return for the second night. 
Two weeks later, however, a review of one of Carrie's spots. We just Jeff want some from- fucking metal. I know. Shut I up. Know. <laughs> I think it was Kurt Cobain had some Nirvana shows where he booked uh, uh, what's it, Bobcat Goldsway to open. And it was the same thing. Like, we just want fucking Kurt Nirvana. Get Come on, up. guys. I'm just trying to sell you a couple jokes up here. <laughs> yeah, guys. I can't do him. I think uh, but, uh, I think Mitch Hedberg has a joke about how he opened for a rock band and it and it went terribly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's like, but and and the thing is, like, rock bands love comedians. Like, uh, Tool, like Maynard, was a huge fan of um, what's his name who died from cancer um, that everybody copies, which he's always referenced. I, damn, I always hate this when I bring up comedians and I can't think of their names. Um. I used to smoke all the time. Uh, I want to say I, it's not Bill Burr, but he's um, George he's Carlin. Of his time. Uh... George Carlin is one of those. But yeah, like it's hard. It's it. He 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 was amazing, and like yeah, like I said, Nirvana. Kurt Kurt was a huge fan of Bobcat, and like I I love the the idea of it. Seems great. Like get some yucks in before before the metal band gets up there but like the general rock going public is <laughs> they just want to watch you know tiffany sway her hit to girls 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 and watch the crew and watch tommy do some fucking barrel rolls in his drum set yeah yeah i i, I and i get it but uh unfortunately he had a rough time doing that but uh, alongside the sizable photo of him doing a stage impression of Sammy Davis Jr. appeared in the Toronto Star on the front page of its entertainment section with the writer Bruce Blackdar raving about a genuine star coming to life. So during his lull there after the rock concert, he got a front page on the Toronto Star. Say for a brief mention in the Barry Examiner, it was the first time Kerry received significant mainstream corporate media coverage and the glowing praise in one of Canada's highest circulation dailies created demand for his impressionist stand-up act throughout the country. In April of 1981, he appeared in an episode of the televised stand-up show An Evening at the Improv. That summer, he landed one of the main roles in introducing Janet, a made-for-TV movie that premiered in September of 81 on the CBC drawing more than a million bureaus, viewers for its first airing in Canada. He's I love that he get, just like, kept charging. He was like, "All right, yeah, I got shit on at that at that rock show. Okay, no doubt, no doubt. Uh, yeah, what's next, baby? The, the rock band Godo. Which <laughs> sounds like a slow version of like a a pig guard in Star Wars. Oh, Godo had a little too much grog on duty. He's also <laughs> chewing on his chewing on the wall thing uh so on the cbc he drew more than a million viewers as we said playing a struggling impressionist comic tony maroney it was carrie's first acting role the cbc promotion the movie had received as well its subsequent high nationwide viewership further solidified the youngsters comedic status in the country by the time the movie finished its CBC run of repeat several years later, its title for the home video release on VHS was changed to Rubber Face. And I, I was duped into that. Like I saw that, I'm like, oh, this is um this is a movie he did. It's called Rubber Face. And he he looked like a baby on it. Because obviously he was. Like he was like twenty and below at the time. So it's like, you know, you want to get as much carry as you possibly could at the time but that's the thing like now in in retrospect in that era like and and we're gonna get to it but i'll just say it like dumb and dumber is like legendary for me like it all all three of those 1994 movies like i feel like they're near comedy perfection like if you want to have something that antithesizes that like mid nineties over the top comedy, just you could just take all three of those movies. Here you go. It's it's perfect. Like yeah. it's it's I have it's like yeah, you know, like you could say like the 
there's some gross out humor, but it's not like over the top. It's, it's, it's just the perfect balance. Like there's all, it, it's everything. I mean, the mask is like a fantasy, but also a comedy. Dumb and Dumber is like, it, to me, it's the, it's my favorite of the three. Like I've probably watched that in the range of like 50 times in my life. And that's, that's not even a gross, like over, no, it's like not even being numbers. hyperbolic. You've gone through yeah, exactly. fifty straight times, and you, you like, you know it. You've seen it. Yeah, I've seen it so many times, and I've done it. Like I literally, when I'm at, um, if I'm at a gas station and somebody's getting a fountain <laughs> drink, I'm like, big gold, big gold huh? huh? You know, like, <laughs> well, right. see ya. See you later. I've been saying, well, <laughs> yeah, I've been saying like that my whole life since I saw that movie. Um, so. <laughs> So, uh, like I said, he he's doing some serious CBC numbers. Kerry was noticed by comedian Rodney Dangerfield, who signed Kerry to open his tour performances. Which this is a big like deal. Got a hat that comes with a bowl of soup. Yeah, I fucking love Rodney Dangerfield. So uh, by December 1981, a well-known comic in Canada, Toronto Star, reported about Kerry waiting for a United States work permit, having received interest from. Johnny Carson's Tonight Show, largely off his reputation from Canada. All right. In the this early, is, these are these I, are big. Rodney Dangerfield and uh, the Tonight Johnny Show. Carson. Yeah, like those are some up in Canada. They're lands. like, oh boy, this local boy is doing real good by us here. <laughs> I think we got ourselves a real star. Um, in the early part of 1982, the year of my birth. Harry reportedly performed the Tonight Show bookers Jim McCauley and Bud Robinson as part of the program's audition process for stand-up comic spot. However, rather than being booked on the show, Carrie got advice to further hone his act, so he went back home to the Toronto area where he had already built a significant following. Touring venues throughout North America as opening act for Rodney Dangerfield, Carrie made a stop at home in Toronto on 19. 19- June 1982, performing two sold-out shows at Massey Hall. Like, that right there, like, if I met somebody who literally, the stories he already has at this point in his life, I would just listen and be, like, silent and just in awe. And Massey Hall is, like, a pretty legendary venue, if I'm not mistaken. Like, one of my favorite, like, super chill-out albums is a a live Neil Young album at Massey Hall. Massey Hall. Yeah. Well, it's a it's a performing arts theater in Toronto, opened in 1894. Neil Young's so Canadian like, too, is right. Uh, sure, <laughs> Come on, he's Canadian. So. Just give, give him, give him, <laughs> give him to him. Yeah, sure. Uh, fuck, Neil Young is an interesting guy. I there's some great Neil Young stuff. Um, so here we go. This is the ramp up. To Hollywood. So in 80, early 83, Terry decided to move to Hollywood where he began regularly performing at the Comedy Store. Getting on The Tonight Show became his immediate career goal, and by spring of 1983, he appeared to have achieved it after getting booked for a stand-up set on the highly rated late night show. However, a lukewarm club set at the Improv got him unbooked. Though struggling to replicate his success in L.A., Harry continued being a big hit in his hometown, Toronto, where he returned during late April 1983 to perform at the short-lived B.B. Magoon theatrical venue on Bloor Street. <laughs> I love that uh, it made B. you B. giggle. Magoon on... <laughs> it made you giggle, and then your giggle made me giggle. <laughs> and so that's just that's just, that's just just good comedy right there. Oh, you're I telling me it... you have a comedy store whose name makes you laugh? That's perfect. <laughs> B.B. Magoon's on Bloor <laughs> Street. Like, yeah, they knew what they were I, doing. I got a big set on Bloor Street. Uh, where I, where I, at on Bloor? Oh, B.B. Magoon's. <laughs> you ever been? Some great no, seats at B.B. Op- Magoon's. <laughs> no, but I opened up for Gadon. Uh, good Lord, these names. It's like Oh, that was you. I was there. I was the one saying, get off the stage. (laughs) All right. So 
three consecutive nights he played on Bloor Street at BB Magoon. While in town, CTV's flagship news, news magazine program, W5, did a feature on Carey that aired nationally in Canada. Back in L.A., within months, he landed the main role on The Duck Factory, a sitcom developed by NBC, and in late November 1983, still got to debut his impressionist act on The Tonight Show, starring Johnny Carson. So that's a big deal. For Goal him. met. Yeah. He's like, uh, I'm going to get out here. I'm, I'm getting on The Tonight Show, and it took basically not very long. No. Set a new, and, and set like, a new it, goal. And, and you know what? There's no issue with going home and doing a couple of laps getting in with like the guys i'm sure the guys at bb magoons were gonna tell him (laughs) you can't not necessarily your yes men but you're like your your hometown buddies like the guys you go to when you're like hey i need your honest opinion yeah the guys who will who will just shit on it until you get it right exactly 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 and for me that's larry so, yeah, I was gonna anyway. say Greg and I always said like when we'd pitch each other ideas, the whole if I'm gonna pitch him an idea, he knows that I want him to poke holes in it until it holds water, or I'm like, nah, fuck, that was a really bad idea. All right, okay, all right, well, we'll come back to it. We'll come back to it. <laughs> we'll come back to it. Oh boy. So anyway, so basically he has this huge appearance and it ends up being um airing nationally and in the united states on the same uh so in the meantime he was cast for a supporting role in the warner brothers comedy production finders keepers shot in the canadian province of alberta during late summer of 1983 for his tonight show appearance that aired on american thanksgiving 21 year old terry went through his most popular impressions elvis presley Jack Nicholson, Bruce Dern, Clint Eastwood, Charles Bronson, Michael Landon, James Dean, E.T., the extraterrestrial, and Charles Nelson Riley. Who yeah, I could see all those. Yeah, well, Charles no, Charles Nelson Riley. In case anybody was curious who that was, he was a American actor, comedian, director, and drama teacher known for his comedic roles on stage, film, and television. He was also a Hollywood Squares guy and very. Uh, he was open about his homosexuality, but he was also uh, for those Sid and Marty Croft fans out there, he was on quite a bit of uh, H.R. Puff and stuff and Lidsville and all those silly 70s, like almost like Muppet knockoff shows. Um, he did all of these characters from characters from My Three Sons, Kermit the Frog, and Miss Piggy in rapid succession. So he's kind of a Robin Williams-esque kind of thing. After completing his set, though getting the okay gesture from Carson, the impressionist comic was notably not waved over by the host to join him on the couch, a usual indication that while sufficiently pleased, the powerful host was probably not ecstatic about the performance. The end of 1983 saw Carrie go back home to Toronto once more for a publicized New Year's Eve performance at the Royal York Hotel's Imperial Room. Really quickly, if I can go back just a second. Of totally. all of his, of all of his, like moments where he probably, like, was like, "Damn, am I good at this?" Because, like, you know, if, if you're a comedian. You're like, "Well, what do these guys at a rock concert know about comedy? They were there to see rock music. They're mad at me, you know." Oh, okay, I bombed in front of a bunch of drunk dudes. Like, oh, fuck them. But he was probably wanting Johnny Carson to wave him over so hard. You know what yeah. I mean? He might even have been ready to take a step, and then, all right, mm-hmm. well, have a good night. Yeah, that was uh, that was probably a a big gut punch moment. Yeah, totally. And you know, it it sucks because he's he know he's feeling there's there's this weird thing, this contrast between confidence and ego, and you don't want to have the ego take over. You want to be confident in what you're doing and you want to be selfless and, and a caring individual so i i've always seen carrie as like overall very caring and um it i think for him it's more about like it's more about acceptance too and comedians tend tend to be 
a lot of them tend to be very narcissistic, but I I don't get that sense with him overall. Like I think overall he cares about everyone, uh, especially like his roots and his family and everything. Like he even if he conveys only- it in a very unique and artist like way mm-hmm. these days, because right that's why yeah. he's he's definitely become very like introspective and yeah um like he he's had a, he's had a life yes i wouldn't be surprised if much like uh what we're getting to in the 90s when he played um when he did his man on the moon role if there ends up being somebody doing a jim carrey biopic about him you know what i yeah. mean um how meta that will be at- yeah. yeah this this actor who was playing Jim Carrey, playing Andy Kaufman, got stuck in the role, yeah. man. Yeah, and and that scene will be in it. Like, the doc that was about it. I mean, yeah, totally. Um, so, fast-forwarding a bit, he was in a... He got the starring role in Once Bitten, shot in early 1985, developed by the Samuel Goldwyn Company. Carey would continue getting film roles throughout late summer and early fall 1985. He shot a supporting part in Francis Ford Coppola's Peggy Sue Got Married, which went into long post-production process. In parallel, he decided to try out for Saturday Night Live again, this time ahead of the show's 85-86 season, being prepared by returning executive producer Lorne Michaels, who was looking to hire an all-new cast. Five years removed from his previous SNL audition, 23-year-old Harry was rejected again, reportedly never even getting the chance to audition his material. They didn't even give him a chance? I know. You know, I get it, though, because... I, and this is coming from a huge Jim Carrey fan. I mean, I'm doing an episode on him so, and with a friend who's also a fan. Like, we are fans of this guy. But I'm saying I get the remarks that I hear from people who aren't necessarily Jim Carrey fans that he can be almost – that it's almost too much. It's yeah, like, I, I definitely know people who, you know, I'll be like, oh, let's watch Ace Ventura. And they're like, yeah. Let's maybe we could do uh, something different. It's kind of that everything in the kitchen sink approach. Yeah, and it it's something I hear I hear people who necessarily get overwhelmed by say a Robin Williams as well. I get that, but to me it it works. I love it. So, um, in '86, Kerry auditioned for uh. He again uh, auditioned for SNL's upcoming system, season. His third attempt at getting on the ensemble sketch comedy show. Third time's a charm. Yeah, right. Finally managing to perform for the show's executive pro- producer, Lauren Michaels, at a Burbank studio with returning cast members Dennis Miller, John Lovett, and Nora Dunn also watching the audition. Carrie was rejected again. Among the group of hopefuls auditioning alongside Carrie on this occasion were Dana Carvey and Phil Hartman, both of whom were hired. Both, uh, I mean, Phil both Hartman. are excellent. Yeah, R.I.P. Holy shit. That, that, that could be an uh, episode in and of itself, too. Yeah, his story is uh, it's a cautionary one. He's a legendary. Um, Sensing that doing only impressions was turning into a career dead end, Carrie set out to develop a new live comedy act, much to the dismay of comedy club owners booking him. He began abandoning trademark celebrity impressions, opting instead to try adding observational and character humor to his comedic repertoire, a process that often involved forcing himself to improvise and scramble in front of dissatisfied live audiences that came to see him do impressions. From 1990 to 1994, Carey was a regular cast member of the ensemble comedy television series In Living Color, which I started this episode off. You didn't hear it. You'll hear it when the episode goes up uh, with his in, informer slash imposter video that he did parroting Snow's informer on In Living Color, which is fucking uh, hysterical. Uh, his In Living Color skits are legendary. While short-lived, the popularity of this series helped him to land his first few major roles 
We're into 1994, folks. Carrie played the lead role in Ace Ventura Pet Detective, which was released February 1994 and went on to gross $72 million in the U.S. and Canada. Following its success and before the release of the next film, The Mask, which was anticipated to be another hit, Morgan Creek Productions paid him $5 million to reprise his role as Ace Ventura, and New Line Cinema offered him $7 million to make a sequel to The Mask and paid him Seven million to appear in Dumb and Dumber, a nearly tenfold increase on his salary. Ace Ventura, the Ma- the Mask, released in July 1994, grossed 351 million worldwide. So beautiful. God damn. It. Also, really quickly, wow. can I just yeah. say that with Ace Ventura, you also got a Tone Loke originally written for the movie song. It rolled over the credits. It starts with That's Jim true. Carrey saying, Tone, put on that big ass size 13 and kick it for the homies. <laughs> <laughs> I, oh. I used to play those credits a lot too, just for that song. Yeah, it's good. It's good. That, I, I, that's how I learned who Tone Loke was. That, you know what? It's because of it's because of Ace that I knew who Cannibal Corpse was. Oh yeah, um, they're, they're playing in the club. <laughs> in the, yeah, yeah. Uh, Dumb and Dumber, released December 1994, was another commercial success, grossing over 270 million worldwide. That's a like he's already pushing a billion dollars. Basically, yeah. Carey received his first Golden Globe Award nomination for Best Actor for his work in The Mask and was voted second on Quigley's Top 10 Money-Making Stars poll behind Tom Hanks. Wow. You're biting it's a good into list the to be on. Forrest Gump's fucking coattails. Carey portrayed the Batman villain, the Riddler, in the Joel Schumacher-directed superhero film Batman Forever. I was... I actually really like that performance. It's over the top. It's super fun though. Yeah, like I the Riddler's over the top. Like I think it yeah. like they that's it was perfect. That maybe is not the best Batman movie ever. But I totally Batman? <laughs> Batman did you say? I'm counting on it. I love his performance. I actually think they could take him and have him be like an old Riddler in one of the new Batmans and it would be super fun. Um the film received mixed reviews, but was a box office success. He reprised his role as Ace Ventura in Ace Ventura When Nature Calls, My First Date. Uh, she kissed me. She touched my leg. It was nice. Nice. Um, like I love that film. Ace Ventura When Nature Calls drops the following year. They're like, fuck, Ace Ventura was good. Let's go. We got to get another one out there. Let's, let's go. <laughs> let's go while it's still hot. Just, there, and there's so many lines from that. And you must be the Monopoly guy. Do not pass go. Do not collect two hundred dollars. Anytime like, there's, there's so- a projector up, I have to go. <laughs> yeah. I ho totally. silver away. Yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah, I love that movie. This is the lovely room of death. Um. <laughs> He's driving down the African highway and he's just bouncing all over the cab of the car, <laughs> pulls out. He's just on the smoothest road you could possibly imagine. I don't care what the critics say. That movie's fucking hysterical. And when he's in the rhino sweating his ass off and then the family sees him and they think the rhino's Warm. <laughs> even there's this even like little moments where like he's going into like uh finally approach the like main hunter the consulate guy and he he had watched the trainers training the elephant so when he's walking in he goes like down bubba and he just sits down on the consulate's car it's <laughs> like every little moment that's where he like flips out of the forest too just like 10 times the car yeah. just like falls apart he lands it Ew, like a glove yeah Chicago. <laughs> um Carey became the first actor to be paid $20 million for his next film, The Cable Guy, directed by Ben Stiller. The film was a satirical black comedy in which Carey played a lonely, menacing cable TV installer who infiltrates the life of one of his customers, played by Matthew Bradwood. I remember I legitimately being like borderline afraid of Jim Carey after this role. 
because yeah. it like when it you just, say black comedy, it's black. It's dark. It is a dark very, film. And like, think about it. For me, 1996, I'm still only nine. I'm I'm not. You know, I'm figuring things out. I know he's mm-hmm. a real guy who's playing a character, but I'm also still mm-hmm. like, whoa, that's kind of scary. Uh, man. It was. It it still did pretty good. It grossed 102 million worldwide, which isn't shabby, but critics kind of panned it they said it was the tone was too different i I love it i think it's a fun movie now um he went on to star he bounced back basically with liar liar in 1997 great movie fucking hilarious movie as well playing fletcher reed an unethical lawyer rendered unable to lie by his young son's birthday age Gary was praised for his performance, earning a second Golden Globe Award nomination for Best Actor. It's also a movie that I quote a ton, including, yeah. I don't know if you remember when he gets his car impounded and they charge him just a shit ton. And he's like, how do you sleep at night? And he reaches in and takes the air pressure and goes, I'm taking this. I Every time I walk up to somebody that I'm going to take, I'm going to go, I'm taking this. I'm, I'm how do you sleep at night. That's literally one of my favorite parts of the whole movie. Yes. It, it, it reeks of Harry improvising. 100%. 100%. And you can tell because it wasn't until I saw like the behind the scenes of Dumb and Dumber and, and heard and found out that that whole sequence where he's like, do you want to hear the most annoying sound in the world? Like that was all improvised. The, how, makes- how Jeff Daniels and the other dude hang on then is beyond me unbelievable yeah unbelievable and and some of his greatest like like and then that again we're we're quoting him all the time but like whenever something goes wrong in my life i literally go through the we got no food we got no jobs our pet heads are falling off (laughs) i say that all the time Uh, Um, I, i i also always say you know along the lines of you know give someone two or three of their fuck ups and then say, yeah. And then you came along and did something like this, and totally redeem yourself. <laughs> yeah. I was a retail yes. manager for like fifteen years, so that was like a good way to, you know, yeah. break the ice yeah. with with a lot of people. Oh, totally, totally. And in our age bracket, like the thirty-five to forty-four age bracket, like that's an immediate way to get somebody to light up and turn around and, and like give you that, give you that. Yeah. Uh, we speak in movie that. quotes. Yeah. Give you the That's our generation, nod, baby. Yes. Yeah, yeah, totally, yeah, yeah, totally. All right, so Liar Liar was a big deal. Um, New York Times said about his performance, well into his tumultuous, tum, tum, tumultuous career, Mr. Carey finally turns up in a straightforward comic vehicle and the results are much wilder and funnier than this mundane material should have allowed. Now, we're getting into his critical acclaim period from 98 to 2007. This is according to the Wikipedia. The following year, he decided to take a pay cut to play the serial comic role of Truman Burbank in the satirical comedy drama film, The Truman Show. This movie is fucking off. Awesome. Yeah, it's like, like it's, I, it's, it's what he probably wanted the cable guy to be, right? Like, hey, you're mm-hmm. not coming to see me be hilarious. You're coming to see a great movie. And right. it's almost like the cable guy prepared him for it. Mm-hmm. And then everybody was like, oh, whoa. And this is this is a movie. I, it's, it, it was unlike anything I had seen before. And at the time, there was like a Matthew McConaughey movie that came out that was like the same type of thing. But the idea of somebody a reality show that was an entire human's life and it's scary it was free youtube free all the shit that we're dealing with now and it's it's super prescient to today it's phenomenal and in a way the ending i love the ending you've got um amazing supporting cast it, it's a phenomenal movie, and he won the Golden Globe Award for Best Actor in a Motion Picture Drama for this, but did not receive an Academy Award nomination. The yeah. fuck? Like that Johnny uh, he Carson just, wave over thing. <laughs> just seems like the kind of actor who would get snubbed, you know? Like, like, ah, uh, 
he'll do something dumb when he gets on the stage. You know, we can't let it happen. He'll talk through his ass. <laughs> which is awesome. Uh, your gun is digging into my hip. And <laughs> Finkel is Einhorn. Einhorn is Finkel. Not necessarily uh, <laughs> a bit transphobic, ladies and gentlemen, but it was a different time in the 90s. So, Kerry appeared as a fictionalized version of himself on the final episode of Gary Shandling's The Larry Sanders Show, in which he deliberately ripped into Shandling's character. In 1999, Kerry had the lead role in Man on the Moon. He portrayed comedian Andy Kaufman to critical acclaim and received his second Golden Globe in a row, but again failed to be nominated for an Academy Award. Yeah, this one it seems kind of bullshit. Like the Truman Show, okay. Like maybe it wasn't yeah. like big time Academy worthy, but this one feels mm-hmm. like he should have at least got a nod. Yeah. For he, me, uh, for me, and no, maybe I, it's maybe it's because like I honestly I don't think I saw it in 1999. I would have probably seen it many years later, to be honest, because mm-hmm. I was like, I don't care to see a Jim Carrey drama at the time. Yeah. My, you know, no, I just wanted I to that. see him be a funny guy. So mm-hmm. seeing it later and like, he, I think I saw it after I heard like, I kind of went a little crazy, you know, when he, when he took mm-hmm. on the role he got, and I was like, Oh, that's interesting. Okay. I'm going to, now I really want to see this movie. And then I saw totally. it. It's like, Oh my, okay. I need to start showing people this movie. Yeah, no, for sure. It, and it's a good movie. I think he unfortunately was, Again, I think, and and Cisco and Ebert were guilty of it too. Like they just didn't like him. And then eventually, I think when people started to realize like he was serious about his roles, like they really started to pay attention to him. Like the critics are like, "Well, we'll give him a chance if he'll cry about his grandma or something." So, um, in two thousand, Carrie reteamed with the. Fairly Brothers, who were the guys that directed Dumb and Dumber, uh, for the black comedy film Me, Myself, and Irene, a film that received mixed reviews but enjoyed box office success. Carrie played it's the so role. It's so good. It, it is so good. <laughs> it it's silly in all the right ways, and he's charming. It, it, he, it's funny to watch because he's just. As he aged, he aged gracefully, but like he, I remember at the time, he kind of looked a little like my dad. And I remember thinking like, you didn't like him and now you kind of look like him. <laughs> and, 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 um, in your face. Yeah, dad. But like, I always think of that scene where after he has sex, he tries to pee in the bathroom and it's just going <laughs> everywhere. Uh, oh, I so I recently every, saw a clip where I think it might have been a director or producer or someone on that clip or on the uh, movie where he said that Jim Carrey improvised the kisses scene where he's where he's yeah. got the three sons. <laughs> and, yeah, because it and, would be awkward as fuck. But yeah. <laughs> yes, and they just like they didn't want to break for the clip, so <laughs> they all. Did. And he's like, if you watch, if you watch, they like you know he almost gets Anthony Anderson to laugh, and then they're like the third guy to kiss him like really hesitates, but like you know, and, and when you watch it, you're like they all totally do. Like they, he almost got him right there with kisses. Hmm. Uh, I love the guy. So he. That same year, Carrie starred in the second highest grossing Christmas film of all time, How the Grinch Stole Christmas, playing the title character for which he received both praise and criticism from critics alongside a Golden Globe nomination. I will just tell you right now that it is the Grinch movie that gets played around the Cromulent household. Uh, The original's Ah. fine. Uh, The new animated one also is fine. (laughs) This one is so good, man. And and maybe I'm biased because it's Jim Carrey, but like amazing practical effects first of all which like he apparently like took cia torture training to be able to withstand getting it put on but Mm -hmm. i I just it was such a better representation of the grinch that you know the original is the original i get it the nostalgia factor is there i watched it growing up too but this one just took it to a whole new level and made it like 
it really brought it to life for me. And he got to play, you know, like his Jim Carrey spin on it. Exactly. Well, it's, it's, I think later on when we get to it, it's that same feeling I had when I watched uh, Sonic the Hedgehog. It's like, oh, he's getting to be himself again. Like, yeah. this is great. And it was nice to experience that with my kids. Now, in 2004, Carrie starred in Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. And I will say this right now. This is my favorite Jim Carrey movie of all time. It's in my top 10 favorite movies of all time. I've watched this. This is a hard one to watch if you've ever went through a heartbreak. But man, during my divorce, I think I watched this like three or four times. And you say, like, yeah, like other people have been through what I what I'm going through. Thanks, yeah, movie. And thanks, Jim. You've had heartbreak too. And um, this film received critical acclaim upon re- release. Critics highly praised Carrie's portrayal of Joel Barish, in addition to the performance of his co-star Kate Winslet. Not an actress to 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 look down on. She's fucking legendary. Who was nominated for an Oscar? According to CNN's reviewer Paul Clinton, Carrie's performance was the actor's best, most mature, and sharply focused performance ever. Carrie received another Golden Globe nomination and his first BAFTA Award nomination for Best Actor. Also, in 2004, he had his black comedy fantasy film *Lemony Snicket's A Series of Unfortunate Events*, which is based on children's novels of the same name. It's also really great. Mm Mm-hmm. And it's weird because Doogie Howser, or what's his name? Neil Patrick actor, Harris. Neil Patrick Harris did the Netflix show. Yeah, which was I, also great, time, but yeah, it, it was, it's hard to hold a candle. Yeah. Jim so, Carrey really, really did it well. That same year, Carrey was inducted into the Canadian Walk of Fame. In 2005, Perry starred in the remake of Fun with Dick and Jane with Tia Leone, which grossed $200 million with a profit of $100 million. Whoa, it made that much money? Mm-hmm. It's a fine That's film. Least wa- yeah. Yeah, like, it's fine. There's nothing wrong with it, you know, but I wasn't like, whoa, man, this is, this is Jim Carrey at his finest. I mean, we didn't really touch on it so much, but like Bruce Almighty is a go-to for me. Oh, like, hundred. I, I mean, to this day, if someone's talking, one of my kids are talking too fast, I always go. <laughs> <laughs> Subscribe to the YouTube so you can watch Jesse. Yeah. Um, uh, but also, like, I don't. I think it got kind of shit on through and through. But the majestic is. Yeah. I like a, the majestic. It's a good movie, man. It, he's he's good in drama. He's good in comedy. But we're going to get to... This is where people kind of cite him having a bit of a down. Uh, Joel Schumacher, the guy that directed Batman Forever, also R.A.P., uh, he reunited with for the number 23 in 2007, a psychological thriller co-starring Virginia Madsen and Danny Houston. In the film... Carrie plays a man who becomes obsessed with the number 23. After finding a book about a man with the same obsession, the film was panned by critics. The following year, Carrie provided his voice for Dr. Seuss's uh, Horton Hears Who. 2008, Carrie voiced Horton the Elephant for the CGI animated feature, which was a box office success, grossing over $290 million worldwide. No wonder we have so many cartoon CGI movies. Yeah. These things just print fucking money. Yeah, I, but I but I'm pretty sure they cost a lot of money to make too. They do, they do. I mean that CGI is no joke. I mean, yeah. obviously, uh, video games stuff like those. The only thing that sucks about CG is it doesn't necessarily age. I don't know if you've watched the first Toy Story. It's still great, but it's like you can feel you really. Yeah, no, I hundred percent know what you're saying. But you know, I think another thing with the with the CG movies and them making a lot of money is they don't have to get everybody in the same place. You know, they can send the script over to Queen Latifah or whatever, and she can record it at whatever studio she wants, and they'll give her notes, and she'll run back, and they don't ever have to be together. But they could put all their names up at the top of the the movie poster, you know, and it brings the people in Mm -hmm. and you can, you can tell a lot of times because like I, I have a seven and a nine-year-old daughter. So for the past Mm -hmm. about decade, I've been consuming children's, you know, media 
and uh these these movies are always just either like really flat and you can tell like oh they weren't together when they recorded it and there's times where it just feels so tight and so good and you're like ah it feels like one of those studios where they almost for sure and then you'll look it up later and you'll see that like that's exactly true that like those the cg movies that really like stand the test of time that people record it together they all hang out the ones that are just the big money grabs and they usually make the money just fine because everybody's going to see it but they just fall so flat because it's just everybody in their parts of the world recording their part with no one to bounce off of and uh, as someone who's been watching a lot of cartoons the last uh, few years i know i get it record together everybody Adam, you, you got to put down your fucking margarita mixer there, man. You can hear it during your vocal. Uh, I am hearing Maui right now. Also, shout out to any Hawaiian listeners. Uh, Jesus. Scary out there. Yeah. We just had a tornado in Michigan. Woo. Yeah, man. I'm just uh, learning about uh, southern humidity. I've only been here for two and a half Dude. months and i am and i'm an amazon delivery guy now oh oh wow nice yeah so i'm you just guys, like you guys work and your your hours are they pretty good like i actually really like it i work four 10 hour days and my okay. my uh the company that i because you know amazon just contracts dsp like mm-hmm. so i work for a different i work for a logistics company who has us drive Amazon vans and nice. our, the company I work for super kicks ass. They're super supportive and they really love us and uh, they treat us good. Um, but awesome. yeah, I, I just got out of nursery routes uh, and I'm <laughs> taking, now I'm getting like the big boy routes. Like today I had 98 stops. And oh, wow. Uh, it, it, you know, they're, they're 10 hour, they're designed to be 10 hour days and it took me nine and a half hours today. So that's about right. Hey, shout out to all our delivery drivers out there. Woo woo. The Lord's work. Yeah. She needs she needs all of her Amazon deliveries on time. Yeah, I did uh, the same city three days this week because basically, you know, we get a little spot and you do it. And I'm really learning a lot about people who orders a lot of, you know, you're like, man, mm-hmm. I've been to this house all three days and today I'm delivering six packages. And I'm like, you know, ma'am, I there's a CVS and a Walmart, right? I could see it. I can see it. Yeah, but that's a long walk. <laughs> and, uh, I already got to walk to the fridge. Anyway, um, ladies and gentlemen, 2008, yes, man. Gary played a man who signs up for a self-help program that teaches him to say yes to everything. That's starring uh, also Bradley Cooper and Zoe Deschanel. Oh, yeah. Zoe. I think the tough part for me was seeing like Jim Carrey and Zoe Deschanel. Yeah. He's like 35 like... years old. Or <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so great to work with you, Mr. Carrey. Yeah, it's weird. Uh, he was also in a great movie called I Love You, Philip Morris, premiering in January 2009 at the Sundance Film Festival before receiving a wide release in February 2010. Carrie played Stephen J. Russell, a con artist, imposter, and multiple prison escapee who falls in love with his fellow inmate, Philip Morris, played by Ewan McGregor. It is a really good movie. How could anything with Ewan McGregor be bad, first of all? And then throw Jim Carrey into the mix. No. Uh, And and I guess the two became really good good friends during that. That's awesome. I want to hang out with them. That would be a great hang. I mean, I I would just be asking Owen, like Star Wars and Danny Boyle stories, and then Jim Carrey. I could just listen to talk. I would I would want to I would want to know some deep cut information about the island because I love that movie. That yeah, Ewan it's, McGregor it's, movie. Yes. Well, <laughs> the island isn't. That's the one that um, uh, where there's like clones. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, for the first time in his career, 
Harry portrayed multiple characters in Disney's 3D animated take on the classic Charles Dickens tale, A Christmas Carol, in 2009, voicing Ebenezer Scrooge and the ghosts of Christmas past, present, and future. Directed by Robert Zemeckis, the film also starred Robin Wright Penn, Bob Hoskins, Colin Firth, Gary Oldman, and Terry Elwood. The film received decent reviews and was a financial success. Harry landed the lead role in Mr. Popper's Penguins in 2011, playing Tom Popper Jr., a, real, a realtor who becomes the caretaker of a family of penguins. It's cute. Start a, it's cute. Yeah, it's fun. There's some, some, some decent silliness to it. He starred alongside former co-star Steve Carell in the directed comedy film The Incredible Burt Wonderstone. I feel like this is under this is an underrated movie. Yes, it is. And there's there's some fun like performances in it. This is around the same time he appeared in Kick Ass Two as Colonel Stars and Stripes. He he also had a bit of an issue with this one because he retracted support for the film two months prior to its release. He issued a statement via his Twitter account that in light of the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting, now in all good conscience, I cannot support that level of violence. Huh. So he took his stand, and I appreciate that. All of the, all of the people who were like, uh, this is my first acting role, this movie Kick-Ass 2, I was in it with Jim Carrey, man, this is so sweet, I think I'm going to get rich and famous. Jim Carrey's all... <sighs> No, I'm I sorry. That, I already have a billion dollars, so I can do this. Yeah. <laughs> I I get it though. I, I do mean, get it. I do get it. Crisis of conscience and things like that. I For sure. And I also think that we're talking about like 10 years ago is honestly and as this is coming from uh, someone who really loves the guy, this is when he was like at his weirdest. Yeah, this was an era that was like I think he was struggling with the idea of his career and he'd hit so many highs so early on. He'd already gone from comedy to drama. He got in his accolades and drama. He, I mean, he could, I feel like, and, and, and look, I'm not in charge of his life or anything like that. I'm just a fan, but I feel like this era is the era where it's like, yeah, whatever he wants to do, he can do. You know, and so he takes a lot of chances, and that's totally cool. Um, he did take a chance and do a Dumb and Dumber sequel, and as a fan of Jim Carrey's, I've never seen it. I I've also, you know, there's too. a lot of sequels that I've skipped due to not wanting to be disappointed. Joe Dirt 2, never seen it. Super Troopers 2, haven't given it a pass. I was a very I big, uh, I was a very big uh, supporter financially in kickstarter for super troopers 2 never saw it yeah. just couldn't I get it i'm sure it's I fine i just it i don't need I've to never i've never seen the thing prequel the thing is my favorite horror movie of all time i played the video game loved it love the movie watch it every year around halloween but I, can't, awesome. I just don't want to watch the prequel because there's no cg in the original it's all practical i'm with you robo Robo team would throw his beer at my head if I if I were we you know speaking of generations who are things we are the consummate white men our age to be like what's with all the lack of practical effects in movies these days <laughs> it's true get off my lawn with that CG creature quit using technology to make things cooler <laughs> I'll take my Yoshi 64 and you can go fuck with your fucking Avengers bullshit. Uh, I want, what is it? I want Stephen King in creep show where he's got like the plants growing all over. <laughs> like that's what, that's what I want. Oh, Jordy, you've done it now. <laughs> um, God. Yeah, totally. I, I agree. Um, it's true guys. It just looks better. That's all. Yeah. So he, he does Dumb and Dumber 2. It's released in 2014. Mixed reviews. Uh, March 2013, Carrie announced that he had written a children's book titled How Roland Rolls about a scared wave named Roland. He described it as kind of a metaphysical children's story which deals with a lot of heavy stuff in a really childish way. 
Perry self-published the book, which was released in September 2013. On March 25, 2013, Carrie released a parody music video with Eels to Funny or Die, with Carrie replace, replacing Mark Oliver Everett on vocals. The song and video titled Cold Dead Hand and set as a musical act during the variety program Hee Haw lampoons American gun culture and specifically former NRA spokesman Charlton Heston. Oh, boy. Dude, I, I grew up in a family that watched Hee Haw. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, boy. That's a that's a throwback, folks. You you Google that one if you want. Also, Charlton Heston, R.I.P., uh, I guess. Um, Carrie delivered the commencement address at Marahashi University of Management in Fairfield, Iowa, in May 2014 and received an honorary doctorate for his achievements as a comedian, artist, author, and philanthropist. Good I will him. say, and and I might play it at the end. Um, he has some excellent, excellent speeches, it, and he's he's a smart guy. I mean, the guy. These are the people. Like I always say this to people, and I think I said it the other day to um, a friend of mine. But when it comes to the world right now, it, it can be such a divisive place online, and even in uh, family gatherings. Um, I always say, think for yourself and really found your opinions on your own. You know, you speak to the, the people who've lived the life. And I appreciate those videos of that, those, those mock-ups on YouTube of, of um, people like Jim Carrey speaking on, you know, life. Cause I, I go to my elders when I, when it comes to any decision I make. Yeah. We were if saying, er, we were saying earlier, like he's lived a life. You know, yeah, like people, totally. people like that, whether they were in movies or, you know, they were your grandpa who went to war or your grandpa who was a mechanic for 40 years. Like these people have seen more of the world than you. And that doesn't mean necessarily that they'll always be wiser. I mean, people who experience right. a lot gain a lot of wisdom. Totally, totally. Um, in June 2017, Showtime began airing the dramedy I'm Dying Up Here, for which Perry served as the executive producer. The show, which chronicles a group of stand-up comics in the 1970s Los Angeles, Los Angeles, incorporates aspects of Perry's own experience. In September of that year, the same network announced that he would be starring in a comedy series titled Hitting, which will would reunite. Perry and director Michael Gondry. By the end of 2017, it was announced that Catherine Keener would start opposite Carrie in Kidding. That's Catherine awesome. I, I, other than like when it was first coming out mm -hmm. and, the, and the teasers were coming, that's really all I've seen of the show. I think now that it's no longer airing, I'm going to watch it. Yeah, no, I, I that that's, this is definitely something I'm going to go back to. Uh, Carrie was also the subject of two documentaries in 2017. The first, a short subject entitled I Needed Color about his lifelong passion for art was released online in the summer. Later that year, another documentary, uh, Jim and Andy, The Great Beyond, featuring a very special contractually obligated mention of Tony Clinton, premiered at the uh, Venice Film Festival and was later picked up by Netflix. Now that I have seen. The film chronicles the behind the scenes drum drama during the shooting of Man on the Moon when he never broke character as Andy Kaufman. It incorporates footage that was shot for the film's electronic press kit, ultimately was pulled by Universal as they felt that it was too damaging. You know, I, I, in that documentary, they I remember his Andy Kaufman's sister speaking about, like, it, it was Andy. He was Andy. It was like she... She, she like it made her cry they cried together like that's what like seeing him like that and the way he was acting like it she was like it was like i had my brother back for a day and i, th I just thought that was so it's very moving yeah yeah and i like i like documentaries a lot and i like that one because it, in life it's all gray man it's not it, it's not necessarily it was the worst ever oh my god everybody died and and the world ended and christmas was canceled or it was the best every like everybody came and the world opened up and we all got cookies like it's it's a great thing you know like there's 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 bumps and bruises but there's some good to be had of the reality and i that that story is 
is great. Like, that's awesome. And, and that's, you know, there's a guy, speaking of Robin Williams, who did this amazing uh, short where he played, it was called Robin. There's an actor, and I'm not doing it justice. I'll, I'll post it on our social medias. But uh, this guy does this Robin Williams impersonation that's so good that it made me miss him and want this guy to do a biopic like nobody's business. But I think the, the Robin Williams estate got it pulled, unfortunately. Uh, but it, it was so good, it was like uncanny. He was nailing him, like his impersonation of Robin Williams, Williams so good. It was like him doing work in, in his trailer and finding out that John Belushi had died, one of his friends. And his conversation with his co-actress about, like, you need to knock off the... And, like, after that, he had gotten sober. Wow. It's, it's a fascinating little thing. And if I can find it online, because it's one of those things that was so good that it, it was constantly getting re-uploaded and trending. Uh, and I, I, I apologize, because I don't know that... It, it's a character actor guy online, and he did a Han Solo one, too, like Proof of Concept. He does these amazing impressions, but... um. Yeah, I don't know where I was going with that. But basically, like, you, it, it's fascinating to see these people behind the scenes. And he, I think at the time he was, and he said this about the 90s in interviews, like, there was no Jim Carrey. There was just this larger than life persona. You yeah. Know? Um, and then we're going to get from June of 2018, Carrie was cast as Dr. Robotnik, the main antagonist of the Sonic the Hedgehog video game series in a film adaptation of the franchise. The film was released in February 2020 with positive reviews. Wow. A month before COVID. Carrie's portrayal of Robotnik was praised with some considering it one of his best performances in years. Carrie returned for Sonic the Hedgehog 2, released in April 2022, which grossed $72 million at the box office in its opening weekend to give Carrie the best opening of his career to date. In 2020, Carrie published Memoirs and Misinformation. In September, during the final stages of the 2020 U.S. presidential election, it was announced that Carrie would portray, portray presidential nominee Joe Biden on the 46th season of Saturday Night Live. Which, it's great. It's really funny. Taking over the role from Jason Sudeikis, Woody Harrelson, and John Mulaney. However, Carrie's high-energy comedy style clashed with real-life Biden's low-key persona, producing an imitation that lacked authenticity and failed to impress viewers and critics. Ooh. On December 19, 2020, Carrie announced that he would step down from playing Biden on Saturday Night Live, stating that he had a six-week deal. Cast member Alex Mulfax defeated Carrie and trained Biden during the cold open of the episode hosted by Kristen Wiig the same day. Carrie appeared as the narrator of the Weekend album Dawn FM, released on 7 January 2022, in spring. In April 2022, Carrie announced that he was considering retirement film industry, explaining, quote, I have enough, I've done enough, I am enough. When asked if he would ever come back, his response was, quote, it depends if the ang angels bring some sort of script that written in gold ink that says to me that it's going to be really important to people to see. I might continue down the road, but taking risks. I mean, he's literally been working nonstop his whole life. True. I mean, there's been some amazing people that have kind of stepped aside, and like Gene Hackman's one of my favorite old timey actors, and he's been off. I mean, he's still alive; he's in his nineties. He's just going to like some local. Oh yeah, I loved him in Welcome to Mooseport. <laughs> I think that was the role where he was like, "I'm, I'm done. That's, <laughs> I'm out. Fuck this Hollywood." Bullshit. He's like, yeah, "Who's this? Who's this Ray Romano? Fuck." Yeah, this guy sucks. That's it. I retire. Uh, no, like that's Jim Carrey, ladies and gentlemen. Woo. What a guy. What a guy. See any of the movies we talked about. Literally any of them. Because the worst yeah. of them are good enough to get you either A, a couple laughs if you're watching the comedy, or mm -hmm. like none of, I feel like none of his dramas are, even for people who wouldn't like him, 
you know, there's plenty of movies that uh, I do the classic husband thing where my wife will start a movie. I'm like, oh, do you want to watch it? I'm like, no. And then I'm standing in the hallway and then, and then I'm leaning on the back of the couch. And then, you know, suddenly <laughs> I'm, I'm sitting down. And I'm, so I feel like all of his movies are that way. Like you can sit and you can watch them and you can, mm-hmm. you know, you're going to get through it and be like, oh, it wasn't maybe my favorite thing ever, but that was, that was a really good, you know, solid movie. And yeah. so whether that's his comedies or his dramas, any any movie you listed is is worth a watch at least once. Totally. And and it and if he's not in it a lot, at least when he's on screen, you can tell like he he's got charisma. He, he there's something that pulls you to him. And like I said, he's he's you may have your issues with Terry, and if you're the old timey guy that's like he's no you know he's no dean martin his mom <laughs> uh well watch a dean martin movie you know what i say to people who complain about things well watch what you like listen to yeah. what you like stop complaining it's not hard not- we have streaming services now you don't even have to like oh this comes on at 8 p.m what are we gonna watch until then first world problems you're guys up- just don't that's watch right. it Exactly. No, instead watch twitch.tv slash Cromulent Jesse. That's, that's where I'm hanging out. The throwback programming where he talks about years and decades and plays trailers. Yeah, next next week, uh, well, depending on when this will air, but sometime... This is, this is coming out tomorrow. <laughs> I love your style. <laughs> so uh, this week, uh, I'll be coming back and getting back into normal streams, and there'll probably be at least two a week. And one of those uh, every week will be, yeah, like Ryan was saying, a nostalgia stream where we pick a year, we go through some music videos or songs from that year and some movie trailers and we all go, damn, I need to watch that again. And none of us ever mm-hmm. watch it again. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> damn, I need to see the number 23. Probably. Yes. And, uh, of course, coming uh, the first Friday of October, the Serial Chillers are back. The break is over. And our big announcement was that we're going to be changing things just slightly. Where There will still be a weekly show, but the game show now is every two weeks. And mm. Greg and I will have a more like, I guess like updates and corrections uh, weekly. So you'll still get nice, you know, a weekly episode, but there will no longer be breaks. There were no no more season breaks in the show. We're going to be able to keep it rolling, and this is going to allow us to do that. So uh, this is the we're ending the last serial chillers break right now too. Nice. Ever. They'll be back, folks. Yeah, and SerialChillersPod.com and has all of our information and links. You can find us there. Well, sweet. Well, thanks for coming on, my dude. It's always a pleasure to have you, and I, I'm a big fan of you. I just sent you your shirt and, and your stuff, so you'll be getting that. I said Monday. Thank so, you. Well, likewise, I also love to come on to episodes that you tell me will take an hour and then we take two. Uh, I take personal <laughs> pride in doubling the amount of time you thought things were going to last. Uh, I hope it never ends. <laughs> I hope hey, every time we do it, it does it, does it that way. It, I, I do too. But the thing is, I think it shows that we're buds and we can talk about things and we're from the same era. And, and henceforth, we would talk about Jim Carrey for a good close to two hours and that's fine. You're you're my buddy. So, all right, man. Well, I'm gonna let you go. This has been our episode. Check us out on in, Instagram uh, dot com slash zanzizi underscore podcast. Also, if you have an episode suggestion, zanzizi podcast at gmail dot com. Check us out on the Discord. We have been doing things with that slowly and surely. We add people and people come in, and sometimes I add bots that I'm confused about. You should join the Serial Chillers uh, Discord because they have a Bart Simpson bot, and that's the coolest shit I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking I'll, of I'll teach you my ways. Candy. Yeah, there you go. He helps. It does help. And uh, also, please rate and review. And uh, five stars, five twinkly stars. More episodes to come. Season one will end end of November, and we'll be on hiatus from December to January and back with season two 
and all the guests you know and love. And uh, we'll have to have Jesse back to do that. Again. Be my honor. So, all right, my dude. Well, you take care, and uh, that has been your episode. Have a great one, ladies and gentlemen. Before you play. Here, I'll stop. Thanks, man. That's fun. Yeah, dude. I 